For a long while, Java had this bad reputation of being a bloated, verbose, corporate dinosaur, but these days this couldn't be further from the truth. Modern Java is actually leaner, faster, and far more elegant than most developers give it credit for. More importantly, however, there are few other languages that offer as many job opportunities or as much long-term stability as Java. So let's spend the next few minutes debunking some of the biggest Java misconceptions and review what the modern Java ecosystem has to offer. We'll start by looking at the five biggest changes that completely transformed how Java feels and performs today. Then, we'll do some hands-on coding using some of the newer generation frameworks that focus solely on performance and a seamless dev experience. One of the biggest changes is that in recent years, Java managed to remove a lot of the boilerplate it was famous for. This is why old Java code, such as this one, can be greatly improved thanks to some modern new features. Let's look at this code in a bit more detail. First of all, we can now use records, which are essentially immutable data classes with built-in constructors, accessors, and special methods. They let us define plain data objects in a single line instead of a full-blown class with boilerplate. Another big improvement is Java type inference and the var keyword. As you might know, Java is famous for being a really strict, strongly typed object-oriented language, and for a long while, it was mocked for forcing you to declare the same type over and over again, even when it was obvious. The first thing they did was to introduce the diamond operator to reduce redundant type declarations when creating generic objects, then, in Java 10, type inference took that even further with the introduction of the var keyword. Of course, the compiler still enforces strict typing, but the resulting code is finally starting to look like a language built in this century. Another area where Java made massive progress is in how it handles concurrency and asynchronous programming. For years, working with threads in Java felt like operating heavy machinery. There is this joke I'm always making, where the books dedicated solely to the Java concurrency topic are much more extensive than books dedicated to entire programming languages. This all changes in recent versions thanks to Project Loom. In short, this project completely rethinks how concurrency works in Java. Instead of forcing developers to juggle complex thread pools, futures, and reactive abstractions, Loom introduces virtual threads, which are lightweight and managed by the JVM instead of the operating system. Traditional threads in Java were expensive, with each one consuming megabytes of stack space and being limited by how many DOS could handle. Virtual threads, on the other hand, are cheap to create, cheap to park, and designed to scale effortlessly. This alone changes how you architect systems. You can write code that reads like it's blocking, while performing like it's asynchronous. We'll see in a second that frameworks are already integrating with Loom to take advantage of this new model, allowing servers to handle tens or even hundreds of thousands of concurrent connections without any of the XML nightmare configuration Java was famous for. Another big update that deserves attention is how Java handles memory management and overall performance. For years, Java's garbage collector was treated as both its biggest strength and its biggest weakness. The old stereotype of Java, being a slow language that eats RAM, came from those early JVM days when the garbage collector had to basically stop time to clean up memory. However, this is no longer the case. Over the past decade, the JVM team completely re-engineered the garbage collector subsystem, introducing new collectors with a total philosophical shift. Memory efficiency also improved drastically. Features like compact object headers, escape analysis, and string deduplication have reduced memory overhead to the point where modern Java applications can run in containers with far smaller footprints than ever before. Next, let's look at how modern Java looks in practice and pair it up with one of the many new frameworks that are quickly becoming real alternatives for the established Spring ecosystem. But before doing that, please let me tell you a few words about today's sponsor, JetBrains. This one's actually special for me, because I've been using IntelliJ for years, and JetBrains tools have always been a part of my workflow long before this collaboration. Now, they just launched a new AI coding agent called Juni, which is tightly integrated with their IDEs and can understand the full context of your code base. This is a huge deal, because when you ask it to refactor a module, generate backend logic, or update UI components, it knows both the context and dependencies around that code. As a result, the output is cleaner, safer, and more aligned with what you'd actually write yourself. What makes Juni different is that it's not a black box. Every step it takes can be explained, adjusted, or rolled back so you can see the reasoning behind each suggestion and guide it as you go. You can check out the link in the description to find out more about Juni. Back to the code, Spring was for a very long time the default choice for serious Java development. It powered everything from banking systems to enterprise-grade backends, but it also carried a lot of baggage. 
Everyone involved in any type of enterprise development probably still has nightmares about XML configurations, complex dependency management, or heavyweight startup times. But the good news is that there is a new wave of frameworks that completely rethink how Java applications are built. These frameworks are designed for speed, simplicity, and developer experience without sacrificing the robustness that made Java popular in the first place. Quarkus is at the forefront of this new generation. It is built with cloud-native environments in mind, and it trims down the traditional enterprise overhead and embraces modern JVM features like GraalVM and ahead-of-time compilation. Just to make sure we are on the same page, GraalVM is a high-performance runtime developed by Oracle Labs that extends the traditional Java virtual machine into a universal virtual machine capable of running multiple languages efficiently. It's built on two main ideas. First, we get a new just-in-time compiler, which replaces the old hotspot JIT and generates faster, more optimized machine code. It uses aggressive profiling and speculative optimizations to squeeze out extra performance from Java and other JVM languages. Second, it enables ahead-of-time compilation by its native image technology. So, instead of distributing bytecode that runs on a JVM, you can compile your entire application into a single native binary. That binary starts almost instantly, uses less memory, and doesn't require a separate JVM installation. To get started with Quarkus, let's head over to code.quarkus.io, which is basically the Java version of Spring Initializer. This lets you scaffold a new project with just a few clicks, so we'll pick Gradle as the build tool and REST as our main dependency. Once the project is generated, the first thing you'll probably notice is how fast it boots up. Quarkus applications start in under a second, and if you compile them to a native image using GraalVM, we are getting in the realm of milliseconds. That means you can restart, redeploy, and iterate almost instantly, which means that Java developers will waste less time in coffee and smoke breaks. The second thing you'll notice is how familiar the code feels. Quarkus doesn't try to reinvent the language or force a new paradigm, so you'll still write plain Java with annotations and dependency injection. This is similar to Spring, but there is no reflection overhead or runtime magic. Everything is processed at compile time, making it both faster and more predictable. Once we define a basic endpoint, we can plug in an ORM and add a data layer to the mix. Let's first configure an in-memory database in the application properties file and then create a plain ORM entity. Quarkus supports both Hibernate ORM and Panache, which is Quarkus's take on simplifying JPA. Note that our class doesn't have a primary key field. That's because the base entity is already providing an auto-incremented ID and also basic CRUD operations. On top of that, we can define repository entities for custom queries, and the system will be smart enough to build the SQL queries based on our method names. The repository is annotated as application scoped, so it's managed by Quarkus's dependency injection system and automatically wired wherever you need it. As a result, we can inject the repository in our main resource file. It's also a good practice to work with DTOs when exposing entities through REST endpoints, since this prevents leaking internal persistence models and gives you better control over what data is serialized. Java records are a great fit to define DTOs because they are concise, thread-safe, and make your API contracts self-documenting. We can then go through all the found users using streams and convert our entities to DTOs before returning the result. The whole idea behind Quarkus is to give you a familiar dev experience, but provide a much leaner, faster runtime under the hood. Micronaut is another modern Java framework built around the same philosophy, and I think it would be fun to explore it together in a live stream. Let me know your thoughts about this in the comments, don't forget to like, subscribe, and until next time, thank you for watching.